Hello, everyone. So it's my second EuroPython as a speaker. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I guess you all came here to learn about my failures, right? <laughs> OK. So let's begin with a short introduction. Uh, so I work at Akamai. We are a content delivery network and also cloud and security services provider. We move tens of terabits of traffic. Um, we have really a lot of servers, and we can do really cool stuff with them. Um, like if you've ever watched Apple's keynote or played Fortnite, you definitely used uh, Akamai's network without even knowing about that. So uh, we. Uh, we tend to believe that we move between 10 to 30 percent of all web traffic. It's really difficult to calculate the, the right value. Uh, so our systems are really distributed, really servers are, the, the network is really vast. And also recently we've launched a quite new product, which is IoT Edge Connect, which is basically MQTT on, on steroids. So we are also uh, very interested in the IoT. And uh, me personally, uh, currently I'm leading development of one of the most core Akamai metadata systems, which is responsible for um, safe and secure, reliable metadata updates in our network. And I'm super happy to be here uh, because my bachelor's and master's uh, were about projects uh, which I which I did for CERN, so uh, CERN is based in Geneva, so not that far from here, and I really fell in love with Switzerland, so I'm really glad I can be here. And you know, working on metadata upgrades for such a big network is really fascinating, and there's so many challenges, mm, and actually, something from, from my field specifically. So 10 days ago, we saw a big outage uh, in, on the internet caused by a bad metadata upgrade. Do you know what was the outage about? Yeah, so that was Cloudflare. Uh, so Cloudflare is our competitor, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, failures do happen. And I believe that it's not failures that define a company, and it's how failures are dealt with and how transparent, transparent uh, the company is about them. So I believe that people at Cloudflare did a really great job dealing with that failure. And do you by chance have anyone from Cloudflare in the room? No one? OK, even if there's no one. <laughs> Even if there's no one here, I think they deserve a big applause because yeah, because failures do happen, and it's how we how we embrace them. So, you know, uh, I think uh, it, it was the first, or I've heard it first from uh, Brian Cantrell during one of his presentation. Uh, when he's usually very emotional and he's sh shouting a lot. And he said that production is a war. It's truly a war. And there's no, uh, there's a lot of victims and everyone's your enemy. And you know, failures do happen in production. Uh, we are not able to test every uh, single branch, every single uh, situation that our co code might encounter, so it's really difficult, so it's really important, in my opinion, that we are open and transparent about failures so that we all can learn from them. So that's why I'm really uh, thankful for, I'm, I'm really thankful uh, Cloudflare that uh, they were so transparent and open about their own failure. And you know, we have failures too. And when you're a CDN and uh, you have a failure, there's always these big, flashy uh, headlines, uh, like uh, taking the, the internet down. 
Okay, so let's move to the uh, to an introduction about async. This is an advanced uh, level presentation, so I won't go into too many details, but I want to like, lay the groundwork, just give you two definitions so that we are uh, on the same page. So what's async? Uh, if we have like a single worker doing a single task, like uh, Gopher, which for some reason uh, burns books, uh, so if you have one gopher and you have a pile of books and you want to burn them, then you know it's a serial sequential synchronous execution. So if we have many workers and we can divide our big pile of books into smaller piles, then we have parallel execution. And async is about having a single worker doing a lot of things at the same time. So with uh, uh, this beautifully edited image, yeah, you can see a single gopher, uh, which basically does, uh, or is in the process of doing a lot of things, but he does it uh, or mm, only one thing at a time. So there's no parallel thing. And async is really useful when we have many similar things to do, but uh, for some reason we cannot process them immediately, we need to, we need to wait for some research, resources or, or other things. Okay, and the second thing is how async, uh, how asynchronous execution, uh, how async I.O. is implemented in Python. So it uses an event loop so basically, if you run an async IO application in the main thread, you're supposed to have an event loop, which is basically a loop of task with tasks which uh, async IO iterates uh, constantly. So the tasks are being scheduled, so they are being put inside that loop, and later they are being checked whether the resources uh, are available and the processing can, can continue. Okay, so a bit of history. Uh, so async.io didn't invent uh, asynchronous execution in Python. So before async.io we had async core modules, async chat, and, and, and similar. But someone in September of 2012 submitted a Python idea entitled async core included batteries don't fit. And uh, it was true that um, using mm, or having uh, asynchronous execution of code in Python was quite troublesome. Uh, so later that year, Guido started with PEP 3156. Uh, then there was a tulip period. And in March 2014, uh, AsyncIO was released in Python 3.4 as a provisional API. That provisional API means that you'd actually need to be mad to start using it in production because a lot of the things might change and it's just, we'll deploy it and we'll see how the community reacts. And also, you know, the, like the most complex bugs can be they usually appear only in production and when people start to use it, so yeah. And the API was provisional and the next release, uh, the syntax changed. So we, we got async await keywords and also some additional tools like asynchronous iteration, asynchronous context managers. And then with 3.6, uh, we've got asynchronous generators and asynchronous comprehensions. And I know that we are currently at uh, 3.7, but uh, I guess my, uh, my knowledge stopped a bit at 3.6 3 uh, when I uh, switched projects. So how async IO code looks like? Uh, let's say that we have an application uh, which processes some tasks and what it requires for processing of these tasks is some network I.O. So we can run it using async I.O. It fits. So we have a loop. We need some data to, uh, to start our task. 
and then what we do, we just mm, we wrap our coroutine with a task and we put it inside an event loop. So this is what the ensure future is for. If we are if we are smart, we can actually get some data beforehand for the execution, and later we can use one of the helper functions of AsyncIO, which is AsyncIO Gather, and we can basically schedule a lot of uh, asynchronous tasks at the same time so that uh, they will populate our event loop and they will be uh, worked on asynchronously. <clears throat> but the thing is that in asyncio applications, you usually uh, should have the main thread which does the, the work and with the main thread if you need to make some operations, arithmetic operations, any uh, logic operations, then you, you are blocking that main thread. So asyncio is not magic. You have one thread and you're working in it. So if you have something which uh, runs longer than milliseconds, seconds, minutes, then you, you should use uh, thread pool executors. So basically, uh, what you want to do is to create a pool of threads or processes, and then you can just delegate running a specific function to, uh, to that executor. And of course, when you're dealing with uh, things that uh, execute a lot of time, then you want to time out at some point to uh, just not block all your execution if, if something gets stuck. So nowadays, you can use uh, either the wait for helper from the async IO, or you can also use this really uh, neat context manager, which will time out uh, the inner call for you. Okay, so why does it all exist? What's, uh, you know, what's mm, all that about? Uh, well, Handling tasks asynchronously, it's quite useful if you have independent tasks. And of course, you could uh, use threads for that. But uh, you know, with, uh, with GIL in CPython, if you have a lot of threads, if you need to process a lot of tasks, then you will start getting congestion uh, from GIL with the amount of threads that you're using. So for 30, 50, 100 threads, you will start observing the, the kill effect. So with async IO, you, you, you are not uh, limited by gil. And also, like I mentioned before, async IO didn't invent uh, running the code asynchronously in Python. So before async IO, uh, there were modules like Tornado, Twisted, uh, which were already asynchronous. It's just they were doing that in their own way. So also uh, because uh, it started to, to be popular to run asynchronous code, then core developers decided that maybe if we made some tweaks and modifications to CPython, we'll have better performance uh, for async execution. OK, so the first story. A story of synchronous asynchronous code. Okay, so we had one of our first projects that we uh, use uh, asyncio was an uh, executor type of app, which basically received some de tasks data, and it had to process it. So what we did in the beginning, uh, we implemented everything. And we had this uh, nice uh, like main application loop, which we would just get some uh, get the task, pre-process it, lock it, and then we would run them. And the thing is that uh, the, the, the problem that we encountered was much later. So we, we had this up inside the run tasks method. We had basically the the loop which we, 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 which you saw before. So we would get data, we would run tasks, and for each task we would await. And it was, I think, after a year ago 
that our application was uh, used more and more. And we found out that actually that application runs synchronously and not asynchronously. And so if we received some tasks, the idea was that we are not blocked and that we can just schedule them for execution and we can just take uh, another ones as, as much as, as we have uh, uh, available slots in our you know, executor. So here we are awaiting the run tasks method and then we are awaiting every single execution. So basically, we wrote a synchronous code using async IO. Yeah, so, uh, so what you want to do in, uh, such, in such scenario, you want to use ensure future, which will just wrap your uh, coroutine uh, with a task object, and it will ensure that your task will be, will be run and it will be put into uh, the event loop. So in the uh, implementation of the run tasks method, we also ensured that our task is, uh, is, is scheduled and run. And then we were super happy, all tests passed, and then we went to production. And wow, new class of errors. So our task was destroyed while pending, and also sometimes we received these huge errors in our uh, STD out, which were not logged by, uh, by any standard logger, that we had um, an exception in one of our tasks and it was never retrieved. So basically what we did, we moved from a synchronous slow application to a super fast application which loses data and throws hundreds of errors. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that we've learned is that you always need to await your futures, your coroutines. So even if you write your coroutine like as a self-contained thing that basically writes its output somewhere or it's right, uh, it, or it writes its error state, uh, then you also still need to like keep keep a reference to uh, to that and also check whether the the task was actually done because the event loop will get rid of it if if no one is interested in in what's happening with it so what what we end up doing is we always when we are uh, we when we are scheduling our task we always keep a reference to it and then we just check whether it was done. And there's, of course, some uh, error handling logic, but uh, it's a simplified example. So, you know, always await your awaitables. Okay, another story. A story of dependencies nightmare. So, uh, after, you know, the learning from the previous application about all possible mistakes that we could make uh, when you start with AsyncIO. Uh, we wrote another application, which was an API using Tornado. And Tornado and Tornado's IO loop uh, was at that time a wrapper for AsyncIO IO loop. So if you used Tornado and if you used Postgres, you wanted to integrate uh, database operations uh, so that they are asynchronous too. So there's a really nice wrapper called Momoko, which integrates with both tor Tornado, AsyncIO, and uh, PsychopG. And also, actually, if you have like a um, application which is supposed to be really performant, what you want to use is a module called UVLoop, which is wrapper for lib libuv, which is basically a replacement for AsyncIO standard implementation, which is mostly in Python. So for that, uh, for all the operations on the on the loop itself, uh, they are moved to to a C extension so that it's much faster. And also, it's quite hard to uh, write uh, async tests. And in the early days, you had to like uh, write a lot of setup code. Uh, so there's this neat module, async test, 
which basically sets everything up for you and it's easier to, to write tests. Okay, so what did we learn? We learned that uh, Tornado uses IO loop, which is a wrapper for async IO loop, so uh, first level of, of wrapping. Then Momoko is another wrapper. Uh, and also between uh, 2016 and 2018, uh, I think there was not a single commit made to the Momoko repository. So basically we used a module which was uh, pretty dead. Uh, when, I, when I was preparing for this pr presentation, I saw uh, some movement in the Momoko repository, so maybe it's been brought back to life. Uh, what we've learned also is that uh, UV loop is really great, but uh, some modules uh, sometimes depend on implementation details of async IO. And for example, async test does that. So if you used UV loop, you cannot use async test. And um, actually the async test module at that time was developed by a single developer. It was not super stable. It had problems with resource allocation and it was not compatible with UV loop. So if we wanted to use it, we, uh, we couldn't run it with the loop that uh, we would like to use in production. <coughs> the other thing is that we started in Python 3.4. So everything was done uh, at that time using uh, async IO coroutine and yield from expression. So we had to move, we have to migrate all that syntax into async await because async await was much uh, better integrated with CPython and actually there were some uh, low level optimizations which would, uh, which were um, suggested, which were uh, recommended to, to use. But we didn't also have uh, we, this problem because like I said before, Tornado was using uh, asynchronous model much before async IO. So when it started, there was no yield from expression. There was Tornado gen coroutine and yield. So in some places we had yield, in some places we had yield from, and it was really, really a mess. Okay, another story, a story of a asynchronous HTTP client. Uh, so, um, basically, uh, another application which we wrote using async IO, like the, the main logic was here. So, uh, what it does is uh, it basically creates an HTTP, HTTP connection, uh, then in, it connects to some API, and then it constantly iterates over uh, the data that uh, comes mm, in the stream. So mm, I would say that this code is good, bad, and ugly at the same time, because it's good because it uses async IO, and it's quite quite performant. Uh, it's it's much it's much faster than than threading. Mm, it's quite ugly because with all the context managers, you actually end up with uh, half of the line length or, or, or even less. And at that time, and I don't know if, uh, if it's already available, like to have a multiple context managers, async context managers, just uh, put into a, a single one so that the indentation doesn't go too, too far. So also the code was ugly. Uh, because there was no uh, a iter method for asynchronous iteration, so we had to use the Dunder version, and there was also uh, no a next method, uh, so another Dunder method. And the code was also quite bad because when we deployed it to production, we we saw something like that. So this is. Uh, graph of memory usage of that application. So you can see that uh, for some time uh, everything's fine. 
and then the memory usage starts going high. And the reason was that the, uh, a, the server API we, we were using was uh, an HTTP one. So the API, the API was designed in a way that we basically open a stream and, and then in a in HTTP request, we would constantly get some monitoring data from the, from the server. And this is not how you're supposed to use HTTP. So after days of, of debugging, we, we like narrowed down the issue to our asynchronous uh, HTTP client. And what we did, we, so, so, so the library uh, doesn't have an option to limit how much it prefetches data. So it creates coroutines for, um, for prefetching data. And if our processing uh, wasn't able to keep up with it, it would constantly fetch more data unless the, the memory was full. So we contacted the uh, developers of that app and they told us that uh, you're using an HTTP client for something that's not HTTP, so we're not going to fix it or uh, accept your, your fix. So in the end, uh, we had to switch to a module which had an option to limit prefetching data. Mm. And unfortunately, there was no such module available for async IO at that time, so we had to switch to uh, the thre uh, threading implementation. Okay, another story. So this is a story of an Elasticsearch pushers async bump. So. Uh, who here worked with Elasticsearch? A lot of the people, yeah. So you probably know that Elasticsearch is super fast if you configure it correctly. Uh, yeah. But you know, even at some point, if, you, if you're like pushing your, your, your performance and your application is really, is really fast, you'll actually get to the limit of your cluster of your Elasticsearch cluster. So there's a lot of benchmarks that you can benchmark your cluster with. And when you approach, the, when you approach those limits from benchmarks, there's basically nothing more you can do. So uh, we had an application which would get some data in a super a fast fashion. So let's say it was an asynchronous queue. Then it would process it a bit and send to Elasticsearch. So, you know, great, we have the entry point is uh, asynchronous, the, out, the output was asynchronous because we used an asynchronous uh, module for uh, communication with Elasticsearch. But the thing was that we, when we pushed it to production and we really put uh, a lot of traffic into it, we saw this. Yeah, so again, the memory usage uh, went really high and the application was, was crashing at some point. But apart from that, we also noticed this. So this is a CPU usage for the, for the application. Uh, so uh, we started suspecting that uh, for some time after we start the application, the flow uh, from, the, from the asynchronous queue was quite stable for some time. And after that, if there was some congestion on the network or anything else going, we would like get a little lower traffic for some time. And then everything that was congested, uh, it was like uh, a waterfall pushing to, uh, to our data queue. And message brokers are really fast and can uh, like survive a lot. And our application also was super fast. But we, we reached the Elasticsearch limit. Uh, so when we started getting uh, 429, 
um, response code from Elasticsearch, which is too many requests. We started slowing down, and but up to that point, everything was fine. Uh, but then, after um, like half an hour more, uh, then we started seeing that our memory usage grows really high. Uh, so we started monitoring how many tasks are we creating, the tasks to process data and push to Elasticsearch. Um, and we also started monitoring how much time it takes to uh, process a single event. And we f found out that our application was indeed super fast, but at some point, when it already created like uh, 10 million of tasks to execute, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to process, the event loop itself would become so slow uh, that we would never recover from that state. So I mentioned that in AsyncIO we have this event loop, so there's no magic, we put task there, and then AsyncIO iterates uh, on that loop. And if you put like, 10 millions or 100 uh, millions of elements, then your iterations will become slower and slower. And after some time, we had so many asynchronous tasks to process that the, the system would never process them because even if the traffic was lower, it uh, would not be able to, to recover and to keep up any longer. So what we had to do uh, is, this is something which is called an async bomb. So there's a really uh, great module called IOJAPS, which basically allows you to limit how many tasks are you creating and how many, it actually allows you to define two, two limits. How many tasks you're allowed to run asynchronously in any given time, and uh, how many tasks can wait in your buffer so that you don't uh, like overflow and that your application uh, doesn't crash. And then you use that scheduler, which basically is a set of queues and, and blocks if uh, any of the limits is reached. Yeah, so that's that. And after that, uh, we have we, we had a story of um, asynchronous service communicating with the asynchronous threaded service. Um, so, you no, know, we are we are living in the microservices world, and uh, almost everything is microservice right now. And uh, we usually tend to believe that if we create our service, it is uh, totally independent from any other services, and. It might be true if you're not doing something like that. So if you have um, an asynchronous service which requires for its job uh, communication with a threaded service, uh, basically what you end up with is a cluster of services which behave like a one big uh, threaded synchronous service. Because our application was again fast, performant, uh, low latency, and stuff. But for every single task, we had to communicate with, with, some, uh, with some other service, which was threaded and synchronous. And you know, there's actually a rule that if uh, your microservice uh, depends on some another microservice, then it's not really a microservice. And unfortunately, we, we've learned that uh, the, the hard way. So what we observed was this. <laughs> I'm really pushing uh, reusage of these images, right? So what, what we observed was this. And actually, this, this uh, history happened like uh, really uh, either during the previous one or really, uh, really soon after. So when we fixed the other one, we saw this, and we started to believe that maybe the applications are contagious uh, or, 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 or something like that. But uh, this was actually a more general uh, problem. Uh, like the, the problem with, uh, with Elasticsearch was uh, like a, a specific instance of this problem. 
So, um, so we implemented uh, like the, the the fix which we used for the previous application. So the uh, um, the asynchronous limits for uh, for tasks, and all was done, and we we didn't see that. But uh, on the other hand, like the limits for the uh, for the previous application were really high, so we could process like uh, fifty thousand asynchronous tasks at the same time, and it was fine. And for this application, when we set uh, the same limits, we would observe that memory would go high, and then after some time it would drop, and also the CPU usage would sometime, sometimes ramp up really high, and then after some time it would either crash or, uh, or, uh, or go down. So that was not like the, the, the main fix. So then, like there, the the other service was not maintained by us. So we contacted with uh, their <coughs> developers, and uh, we've learned that the other service basically is a, uh, is a view for a, for a database. So basically, it has like twenty threads, and if you want some data, it uses a thread and. Um, it performs some SQL operation and gives you the data back. So we couldn't have like 50,000 asynchronous tasks, which would basically wait for 20 threads uh, to get some data from. So I think it's really, we've learned that, uh, first of all, you cannot, if you're running uh, an asynchronous application, like you really need to know what other systems you depend on. And also if somewhere in the line there's a system which, is, uh, which doesn't scale very well, which is quite slow, then it might not uh, make sense to have like a super fast asynchronous uh, application which would basically for most of its time wait for the, for the slow system. Okay, so up to this point, I told you only bad stories and uh, our problems with Elasticsearch, with uh, AsyncIO, uh, but we also have some good ones. Like after learning that, we uh, went back to the drawing board and we had yet another service to implement. So we made sure that it's uh, really, really small service which does one thing and it does it uh, good. So uh, we received the task to re-implement a system that was causing problems. What a system would do, it would get some data in batches, let's say like uh, 20 millions of entities to process for each entity it would make a DNS query and then uh, push uh, the results back to, to some other system. So we used uh, AMQP for communication for that system. And, uh, and one thing was that the, um, the implementation at that time was synchronous. It was using uh, threads. And it actually had this really nice benchmark which would calculate how many threads uh, you, you, you should use to, to have the, the best performance. The problem was that in order to process 20 million messages, it would need 12 hours, which was uh, too much. So what we did, we re-implemented it in AsyncIO because we had AMQP uh, at the front and at the back. What we had to do was DNS queries, which are uh, asynchronous in their nature because DNS uses UDP. So it's you send something and hopefully it will return to you at some point. So no handshakes, just uh, super easy. And with like this was the main logic of that application. So we would use uh, uh, AsyncIO mm, DNS query. And we, uh, 
So we went from 12 hours to eight minutes with AsyncIO. And the funny story is that when we first ran the application, it, it, ran, uh, it ran great for the first five minutes, and then uh, all DNS servers stopped responding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we were super afraid that uh, we caused another headline, like Akamai DNS servers went down. But it turned out that in five minutes, uh, Infosec called us. <laughs> it's always funny to receive a call from Infosec right after you deploy the new version of your app. <laughs> so they told us that we have uh, malware on our server, and the malware is trying to uh, bring down the <laughs> DNS servers. <laughs> Yeah, and when we told them that, no, it's for that system, is business as usual, and there's, there's nothing wrong, it will perform that way. So they, they told us that uh, it's fine, that DNS servers will be fine with that, but uh, next time maybe we'll, uh, we should give them some heads up. Uh, yeah, so sometimes being too fast can also cause you problems. Okay, and, and another story, as I'm slowly running out of time, is just a story about if you have, um, if, um, if you thought about a lot of things that you uh, can encounter, if you prepare your application to be an async one, if you have, if you use communication, which is asynchronous, so entry point and the, the, the output of your application, then the entire architecture uh, and the entire uh, way um, in which your application is written is also really, really simple and nice. So for example, if we, nowadays, if we use async.io, uh, we really try to use uh, message brokers, AMQP ones, so that we can basically get data in an asynchronous way, then we can make some processing asynchronously, and then we can push data in an asynchronous way. So using like this, this, this pattern, it makes your application super easy and simple. And even if you use uh, you know, asynchronous tasks, it's quite easy to, to debug it if you don't have additional threads or, uh, or any other things. Okay, so what are pros and cons, in my opinion, uh, for using async.io? Well, you can definitely gain some performance if you're relying on uh, I.O., if your application is I.O. bound, so network or DB. And there's an asterisk for DB because uh, databases are usually uh, threaded applications. So make sure that you have enough workers on the DB side to, uh, to not bring it down or to just uh, use it to, to its fullest. Well, you get better resource utilization because you spend uh, less time on communication and, and synchronization compared to, uh, to threads. Uh, you, if you use async.io, you are on the technological edge, which gives you new ways to solve uh, old problems, which makes you more creative. And it actually makes you follow Python progress and contribute because uh, there's still a, a lot of features missing. Uh, regarding async.io. And what are cons? Well, there's still a lot of features missing. Uh, so uh, async iterators in have messy indeterministic cleanups. Iter tools for async is missing. And a lot of modules which allows you to interact with popular services like Zookeeper, Elasticsearch, they are still uh, quite uh, young and uh, the implementation uh, implementations are are quite early and uh, also for some of the for some of the systems there's a complete lack of modules async io compatible modules so you know uh, young implementations with many bugs and actually async io uh, 
caused our community to become more and more divided because a lot of modules maintainers uh, uh, they decided that they will not port the modules to async IO because they they don't like it. So okay, last slides. Uh, so what projects are best suited for async IO in my opinion? Micro services, like I'm putting an emphasis on micro. Project with a small list of dependencies uh, so that you understand how your uh, how introducing async IO uh, will uh, interact with um, other dependencies. Simple HTTP APIs, projects with big load but light processing, so uh, a lot of small tasks, not, uh, not heavy ones. Uh, projects where threads are not enough, where you need like 50,000 uh, asyn asynchronous tasks, and projects where the rest of the, your technology stack is well understood. And what projects are not suited for async IO? Projects which architecture heavily relies on threads, they are difficult to migrate to async IO. Projects with dependencies heavily using threads. Uh, projects where processing of a single task take a lot of time because you don't gain anything from, from running async in these projects. And projects doing uncommon stuff like communicating with legacy HTTP uh, services. So, okay, I don't think we have time for Q&A, so I'm here, I think, for an hour or two more because uh, my plane leaves in the evening, so you can just grab me, you can have a coffee, and we can share some more stories. And also, you can contact me using either my email or my Twitter, which I think uh, I have, like, one or two tweets, so it's not some bot account, it's just... I'm slowly getting into Twitter. Okay, thank you very much.